title of the message tonight is A Few Good Men. And I don't think it's the first time I've ever used that title. I'm sure fathers, it was a Father's Day message or something where I've used that title before. But I don't remember what I preached, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but today, the uh, title again is A Few Good Men. In, in a way, it's a kind of a piggyback off the message I preached on Sunday in Ola on American Made, which had nothing to do with America, but it was that phrase, American Made, which stood for, at least at one time when we said, hey, this is made in America, what we meant was a good quality. We knew it was going to be something uh, that was that was a good quality, well-made, good craftsmanship, and, and that was the idea. We talked a little bit on Sunday about patina, and when something's weathered and worn and you begin to just kind of see the effects of the age in it, it actually increases the value because you know there's a history there, there's a story, there's some some things that have uh, have been done. But ultimately, we're talking about uh, uh, just and, and of course the 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 reference was made to how uh, the application was made to people. Of course, the, who cares about things? People should be good quality and and they should even show some patina and all that was what we talked about on Sunday. So a few good men. I want to uh, uh, kind of sort of piggyback off of that message. And I remember watching a uh, man here not too long ago. I've already talked about it plenty of times. I won't labor on it too much, but uh, about a recent army recruiting video uh, that, you know, everybody in here is probably familiar with. And I remember thinking, what in the world? And I remember when I first watched that, all that went through my mind is I remember a particular commercial. Of course, my dad was a Marine for 20 years and, and uh, a particular commercial that maybe you remember, I don't know, it might be before some of y'all's time, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna age myself. <clears throat> but there's a guy, it starts with raw metal. Who's seen it? And it's, it's the, the steel's coming out of the, for, the, the he's forging this, the sword and the steel's coming out of the fire and he's like, ching, and it's like, shape it. And then it's like, laser polish it or whatever. And then, and then it, that's a real simple commercial. And then it shows this Marine who's been through boot camp and he's in good shape and he's got his dress blues on and he takes that sword and goes, whoosh, and it's like, we're looking for a few good men with the metal to be Marines. And then, uh, I think I'm missing part of that. I can't remember, but yeah, anyway, the few, the proud, the Marines, you know, th that was the, the idea. You know, that was the idea. Like, we want to be proud of what we're producing in the United States military, and it's particularly the Marine Corps. And, uh, and that word there that says uh, metal, with the metal, and of course, they're, they're beating on metal. So I just always thought that was M E T A L. Actually, the word is metal, M E T T L E, I believe. Does anybody know? Am I right on that? Okay. I'm pretty sure that's right. <laughs> But it comes from the same word, all right? It means the same, it basically means the same thing, but one is talking about a person and one is talking about just a, a, a metal, like a alloy. And so the, uh, the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, what they're talking about is somebody's ability to endure difficult situations, all right? And so it's a, they did a kind of a play on that word metal, but it comes from the same word. And, uh, and, and then the other thing that I thought about in that commercial, it says the few, the proud, the Marines. And you would think a military recruiting ad, you're like, hey, we want as many people as we can. I mean, we're, you know, if we go to war, we want a lot of, of, of military folks, a lot of soldiers, uh, soldiers as army, a lot of Marines, uh, soldier, whoever, you know, uh, the Navy. I mean, we want everybody. We want as many people, all hands on deck, right? We, we have a war to fight. But then I thought it interesting that they said the few the proud, like only a few are going to be the, the elite and they're, they're going to be the Marines. But I thought about this, really, if you think about it, a few good men can get a whole lot more accomplished than a whole bunch of bad men, <laughs> right? A few good men can turn the world upside down, according to the Bible, right? But, or you can have a whole bunch of guys that are just like so-so, and they don't really get anything done, but they're just a lot of men, you know, <laughs> claiming the name of Christ or whatever, if you're going to make the application. All right. So I, I thought that was interesting. A, a few good men. Well, in the Bible, when we see uh, in the book of Acts, the kind of, I know Jesus started the church, but kind of the, the, the beginning of that New Testament church after Christ that he said, you know, you, you know I'm going to send you into all the world, preach the gospel and make disciples. And, and we see the early church forming and we see a lot of examples in the book of Acts of what the Bible would say, good men. 
Now, the scripture came up today. We were on the way back. Uh, we had a long conversation with a Jehovah's Witness, and the idea uh, came up where they said, you know, they didn't believe that Jesus was God. And so we talked about that scripture where Jesus said to that guy that said, hey, good master. And he said, why callest thou me good? For there is only one good, and that's God. And that's a good scripture to use because essentially Jesus was saying, I'm God, right? And we know the Bible says there are none good, no, not one. Uh, you know, over and over we see that idea. But then we see in the Bible where people are called good, right, or righteous or whatever. So obviously what we're talking about is not that we have come to the level of godliness where we are all good, where we are all, there's nobody like that. There's nobody who can really say that we're good. In fact, any goodness that we have would be attributed to Christ and his righteousness, right? And so uh, so we understand that in a, in a manner of speaking, he, uh, spiritually speaking, there is nobody who is good. But when we're looking at a, a, a in the flesh, when we're looking at men and women, uh, and we're saying good men, I hope you understand uh, what I mean by that. Okay, so uh, in the start of the church, we see a lot of this title of good men or or something similar. And what we see happening is particularly is after Paul gets saved, and I'll talk about him in a minute, uh, he begins to even start this missionary team that's going to go do amazing things for the cause of Christ and, and reach a lot of people. And particularly, we're talking about a few good men, and he gets all these men, but along the way, he also finds some good women who are very helpful. Uh, we think of, uh, uh, um, um, all I can think is Dorcas, but I wrote down her real name, Tabitha. And we think of Tabitha, Dorcas is a funny name, let's just admit it, but it, but it, it wasn't funny back then. Dorcas uh, was a good woman. Lydia is a lady who gets converted, and she is a good woman. Priscilla, Aquila's uh, wife. These are, there was a lot of good ladies as well. Uh, and for, of course, you know, some people say behind every good man is a good is a good woman. That's kind of cheesy, but anyway, <laughs> there's some truth there for sure. Okay, so uh, let's look at a couple examples real quickly. Ananias. Okay, this is the first person that. Uh, God sends Paul to after he, his experience on the road to Damascus. Look at Acts chapter 22. Obviously, we're going to see him in, in chapter 9, uh, or we actually already did. But in chapter 22, Paul's giving his testimony about what we read about in chapter 9. And look at verse 12. Acts 22, verse 12 and he's giving his testimony, and he's, and he's saying that he came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked, uh, looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest uh, hear the voice of his mouth. And so, uh, anyway, we'll talk more about, Paul, about Saul here in a minute. But Ananias, it says he was a man of a good report. Uh, we could go, you know, follow some other guys. Barnabas is another guy in that early church. Look at uh, chapter 11. Acts 11, verse 24. It says, For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Okay, it's talking about uh, the, the life of Barnabas there. And it says, He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. How about uh, chapter 4, where we were first introduced to Barnabas? Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Tells you a little bit about Barnabas. Acts 4, 36. And Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So when you first introduced him, you're saying, hey, that's a good guy. You know, he's just really sold out to this work. He's really sold out to, uh, to, to serving the Lord. And then we see there he's called a good man. Uh, Ananias was a good man. Saul himself, if you think about it, uh, Philippians 3, verse 4. Let's go there first. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, 
Philippians 3, starting verse 4, Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness uh, which is of the law, in the law, blameless. So even before Saul became a Christian, you know, he unknowingly was persecuting the Christians like, like, like he was wrongfully doing that, of course, but he was doing it in his zeal for the Lord. He was saying like, I was a Pharisee. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Uh, I, I, I was blameless concerning the law. Like you couldn't have pointed his, your finger and said, hey, you broke this commandment or whatever. And Paul's saying I was a, he was a good guy. All right. And we understand that. We follow the story uh, about him. Look at Acts chapter nine, back in our text uh, that we read from. And I'll, I'll read a little bit farther, starting verse 26. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, uh, with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which when uh, the brethren knew, they brought him down to, Caesare uh, to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Uh, then had the church rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost or multiplied. So we see right away the character of uh, of the apostle Paul, right, or Saul at the at the very beginning. The character that he had, you know, was that of a good man. Have you ever been out soul winning, or maybe just know somebody at your job, or somebody uh, that you know, a neighbor or a friend, and you're just like, man, I wish that person would get saved. I mean, you want everybody to get saved, but you're like, man, if that person, if they got saved, they could do so much for the Lord. And you're just looking like, like, uh, why won't they trust? Why won't they trust Christ? I don't know, but they're just, they've got that, that makeup within them to be a good person and be profitable and to be, do, you know, and obviously again, we know spiritually they're not good. If they're good, one thing they would, they would trust in the Lord. Uh, but on the, in the flesh, these are good, upright people. And, uh, and it seems like in the early church, there was just, tons of these that were coming to the faith and that they were adding, joining the team, if you were, if you will, the missionary team of those who are going to go out and reach the world. So, I mean, I guess the, the, the central idea of this message is just that we need a few good men. I believe we have some good men in this church and, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be added uh, to a whole lot more, but just some thoughts about what, what is meant here by being a good man. All right. Number one, we see that over and over in this, in these examples, there's this idea of them having a good report, right? And particularly it says a good report among the Jews. Okay. And, uh, and I'll explain that here in a minute, but, uh, but they had a good report with those who were out. Uh, in fact, you know, we saw that about, um, about Ananias. Uh, we, we, we kind of get that idea about Barnabas. Saul is pretty much saying, Hey, you know, you can ask all the Jews, you know, that knew me, uh, outside of the fact that now they they don't you know now he's 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 on the Lord's side and so they're against him but but if you ask them if you if you check his background they're all going to say yeah hey, this was a Hebrew of the Hebrews he he's blameless concerning the law he is a good uh, he's a good guy in chapter ten we're going to see about a Gentile Cornelius who it says he had a good report among all the Jews okay and he comes to the faith as well we don't hear much about him after that uh, after chapter ten but this is this this phrase that we see he had a they had a good report among the jews now obviously we should have a good report uh, uh, you know i'm going to explain what it, what the significance is about the jews right now but oh a good report among everybody in fact first corinthians 10 32 i should have just quoted this one but uh let's get it exactly right first corinthians chapter 10 verse 32 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, 
Paul is saying to the church of Corinth, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So he's saying, hey, if you're out there uh, among the Jews, right, don't give offense. Don't give occasion for them to, to, to find fault with you. If you're walking among the Gentiles, don't give occasion for them to, uh, to, to find fault with you. If you're in the church, obviously, don't give an occasion. Okay, so obviously we're supposed to have a good report among, among everybody, okay? But what was significant about these people who were converting to Christianity who had a good report among the Jews is that the Jews were supposed to be the religious leaders and the, those who were setting the example. These were supposed to be the, the sheep, you know, Jesus' sheep. But obviously not all of them were sheep, and so a lot of them rejected him. But among the Jews, those were, uh, if you will, Christianity before Christ revealed himself. And so, so that was the religious people. Now look, I think this is interesting that he said that because who cares if somebody had a good report among people that rejected the Lord, right? Who cares if, if he had a good report among the absolute heathen that hated God, right? Because here, here's why I say that, because there are some people that, you know, if you ask the right person, well, what do you think about Justin, right? They're going to be like, oh, man, he's a radical. He's a, he's a fanatic. You know, uh, there's some people in his life that you could ask, and they'd be like, oh, man, you know, that guy, I don't want anything to do with him. All he does wants to do is talk about Christ. And we would be like, hey, amen, that's a good report as far as I'm concerned, right? But that might be a bad report from that other person's perspective. So it didn't really matter if we go to some person who, who hates, hates the Lord or something like that, and we ask them, you know, what do you think about uh, uh, Justin? I don't really care what their opinion is, all right? I want to know what is he like among people who are decent people, whether they're saved or not saved, they're decent people. You know, what is his report among, among them? Yeah, he's a good guy. They know what that means. You know, he's a good guy. Uh, I understand that there's going to be people that, you know, what means what what good their definition of what a good man is is a little different you know uh but but here's here's what i mean so if i were to go to your boss right or let's put it this way your past bosses that you've had on the jobs and i were to ask hey what do you think about so and so their behavior on the job. I mean, were they loyal? Did they show up on time and they, and they worked hard and they didn't complain and they didn't do uh, all this thing? You could trust them. They were honest, you know, and this is what it means to have a good report. You know, if you go to this person and you uh, uh, go to the boss and, and, and the boss says, oh, man, this guy always loyal, always trustworthy. I could I could rely on them. That's what it means to have a good report. What if I went to your neighbors? You're right, in your community. Again, I'm not talking about the ones who, who hate you because you love the Lord or something like that, but most people aren't haters of God. Have you ever noticed that? We notice that when we go so many, like not everybody just hates God. A lot of people aren't saved, but that doesn't mean they just hate God. And so uh, if we talk to your neighbors, you know, they should say, oh yeah, so-and-so is a great neighbor to have. They're a good person. And they might say some weird thing. They, they, what's important to them might be like, you know, they take care of their yard, you know. Uh, they, brought their, they brought the trash from, my, they won't say that about my yard very much. <laughs> they brought the trash uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, the yard, you know. We had a neighbor in Oklahoma City who, uh, I don't know what it was, but he had his ups and his downs. Sometimes he loved me and sometimes he'd come out just yelling at me for no reason. And I remember one time I took his trash from the road because he had a, a, a some kind of uh, I guess I guess diabetes I guess it was diabetes he was born with a really really severe type and uh, so he limped he had some bad foot or something like that and so I took his trash to you know to his backyard for him and that meant the world to him I mean I went I was going to get mine anyway and I just stopped and got his you know what I mean and so you know if you would have asked him I hope he would have been like, yeah, he's a good neighbor. He does this and he does that. But then there was other times he would be like, oh, you know, just coming out and just trying to find fault. I even took him out to, to breakfast one time and we talked. He was a runner, so we talked about running and all this kind of stuff. And, and I tried to be a good neighbor. Of course, I tried to preach the gospel to him. He didn't want to listen, but, uh, but he was, you know, he was my neighbor. And even though he was a, a hard guy to like, I wanted to establish a good reputation. I wanted to have a good report with my neighbors. And if we asked your neighbors about that, I wonder, what would they say? You know, do you have a good report? What if I went to the previous pastors of churches that you've been in and uh, said, what do you think about so-and-so? 
uh, they have a good report. Many of you guys know that uh, some, uh, when we started this work, we became known around this area as the a new IFB church and the people that follow Stephen Anderson and all this stuff, which I tr I've, I've tried to tell them, no, that's not it. We're independent. We just listen to some of his preaching. We agree with some of his doctrine and all that. Uh, but we had that stereotype. And when we started this church, uh, I went to, I, I contacted the pastors of those people who, who started in the work at the very beginning. And I contacted them, let them know uh, what was going on when we started soul winning together and all that stuff. And you know, it was, it blessed my heart to know that the, the this pastor, uh, one particular pastor uh, that lost two guys, well, I guess I don't know why I'm not saying the name, but Brother Justin and Brother Austin, uh, they had been going to that church for a while, but they felt like, hey, uh, it would be really good for them to come here and be a part of this work, and the focus was on evangelism, and the focus was, uh, you know, just a little bit, we have some different philosophies. And so we worked together, and that pastor said, well, one thing I can say for sure you know, if I'm going to, if anyone's going to link them with uh, Stephen Anderson is that, you know, they changed my mind as to what an Andersonite looks like, which they're not Andersonites, but that's another story. They said uh, they changed my mind because they came, they weren't knuckleheads, they weren't, you know, argumentative, they didn't cause trouble and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they were good guys. Well, praise the Lord. That's what we're looking for. People that have a good report with those who are without or those, uh, you know, uh, among the religious people particularly or the good uh, upstanding people. We want to have a good report. First Timothy chapter three. This is actually qualification of a pastor. Not that everybody's going to be pastors, but uh, obviously pastors are supposed to set an example of what the congregation is supposed to be like. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not a greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, and not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Uh, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. It would be hard for a pastor to have a bad report in the community. Even, even if it was something a lot that happened a long time ago, that's part of being blameless, right? Is not having that, that glaring thing in the past that everybody that, that knows you can say, hey, well, that person used to have that. We want to have a good report, you know, among those who are without. And again, there's going to be people that hate God uh, who are going to hate, hate you and say that you're a bad person. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just the average upstanding person who's like, yeah, I can vouch for them. They're a good, uh, they're a good person. This is important, all right? Looking for a few good men. One thing is they got to have a good report with, uh, with those who are without. Okay, number two, a few good men who are going to be in this, uh, this missionary team or this, this church setting uh, or uh, let's call it the Lord's, uh, the Lord's army, right, to be a little uh, corny. They have to be men with a calling, okay, men with a calling. What do I mean by that? Well, they need a sea of sea of vision, right? And have this feeling in their heart that God wants me to be part of this. Uh, now, here's the problem with the calling. <clears throat> Growing up, independent fundamental Baptist, uh, you know, I've I've seen that word abused, right? And everybody's got a calling, and everybody, the Lord spoke to me, and you can't argue with them because God told them to do this or that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, a lot of stories come to mind. But here's the deal. I'm not going to make light of a calling because I remember as a nine-year-old boy telling everybody, God's called me into the ministry. I didn't know what that meant. I say, maybe I'm going to be a pastor. Maybe I'm going to be a missionary. Years later, I kind of lost that a little bit. But then in my teenage years, around the time I met Valerie, I felt that renewed passion that God's called me into the ministry. I thought I was going to be uh, uh, a missionary at that point, you know, or 
one wants to surrender to Africa, right? <laughs> At least they spoke English where I was going, but they wanted to, uh, but I was just going to surrender to the ministry because I felt some kind of calling on my life. Now, look, I didn't end up in Africa. I didn't end up maybe thinking that I was the ministry was going to look like what I thought it was going to look like or whatever. But here's what I know. God had called me, given me a burden, right, to, to serve the Lord with my life. And, uh, you know, I find that when it talks about the qualification of a bishop, it says, He that desireth the office of a bishop, desireth a good thing. And elsewhere it talks about desiring to be a prophet. Paul says, hey, that's the greatest gift, desire to be a prophet. So, you know, it's good and right for us to say, I want to serve the Lord. Here am I, Lord, send me. You know, whatever you have me to do, I'm, you know, you, that, that calling upon my, uh, upon my life. I remember speaking of military. Uh, again, my dad was Marine for 20 years, and so here I went to Bible college and, uh, you know, didn't, uh, didn't really see myself being in the military. But somewhere around the time I started uh, having kids, realized uh, maybe I'm getting older. <laughs> I don't remember how old I was, 29 or something like that. I looked up and I saw that you know, that was the last year that I could get into the military, right? That was the last year. I, don't, I might have been younger than that. I think it was around 29 because, yeah, it was the same year that I ran my first 100-miler, and I felt like, man, I, I could physically run 100 miles. You know, maybe I could do something, you know, something important. I can serve my country or something like that is what I thought. And so I said, this is the last year. I even tried out for the uh, uh fire department because I thought, man, I could, I could do something with my health <laughs> anyway. Uh, and so I thought, you know, this is my last year. Maybe I should consider going into the reserves and doing some time and serving the, Hey, if you, if you ask me today, I mean, they couldn't pay me to go. <laughs> they couldn't pay me bukus of money to go into the military today. But uh, back then I thought, well, maybe this is my last chance. Maybe I can go. And I remember talking to my dad about that and saying, dad, you were in the Marines 20 years. I just saw that this is my last year. I'd be able to go. What do you think? I go into the reserves, they, they pay for my college, I can do some service to my, uh, to my country and all this. And my dad was trying to be polite, but he was like, you know, I think you're in Bible college for a reason. And I don't really think that you're the warrior type. And I remember being a tad bit offended by that. What do you mean I'm not the warrior type? My name's Rocky. <laughs> he says, you're not really the warrior type. And I knew exactly what he meant and I knew he was right. And he said, you know, you feel God's called you into the ministry. I think you should just be in the ministry and praise the Lord for that, because that's exactly right. I wasn't called. God didn't call me to serve my country in the military. God called me to, sorry to be corny again, but the Lord's army, right? I got a greater work that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to do for, for the Lord and for my country and for my, uh, my community. And so uh, I believe that somebody, uh, the, when I say a few good men, I'm not saying everybody has to be called to be a pastor or called to be uh, a particular ministry or, or what we would call full-time ministry. Every time you say that, there's somebody that's like, everybody's full-time ministry. You know what I mean? Somebody who's just kind of dedicated their life to that. Maybe it's a paid position or whatever. Uh, what I mean by paid is so that you can devote all your full time to that and you don't have to worry about other things. Uh, so whatever the case, not everyone's going to, it's not going to look the same way. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have a calling on their life. And I, I just feel like everybody should know, you know, the lady we talked to today, she didn't get saved because uh, she was kind of confused on it. And she was raised Catholic. I'm sure that has a big part of it. But she uh, she did not understand. But yet she felt like she was talking about her history, her past. You hear this all the time. They're like, well, I know, you know, God's uh, God's with me because this happened and that happened. And, and uh, all my friends tell me that God's got a great purpose in my life. And I said, I said, I have no doubt that God has got a calling on your life and there is something that he wants you to do for him. I have no doubt, right? But here's the deal. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? So we all have a calling on our life, but only few are going to pick up or take up that call and be like, man, God's convicted me. He's got a purpose for me and a plan. I believe he's got a purpose and a plan for everybody, uh, but he's got a purpose and a plan. And, uh, and there are some people, I believe, that are specifically giving, given maybe a special type of a calling, like the Apostle Paul. The Bible says, look back at Acts 8 again. I'm sorry, Acts 9 again. Uh, look at verse 15. <clears throat> now this is... The Apostle Paul, again, Hebrew of the Hebrews, 
But when Christ came, for whatever reason, he hadn't yet made that jump and said, I received Jesus Christ. He was just trying to be a good Jew, right? Obviously, that didn't get him, that didn't get him into heaven. Uh, and the good works never gets anybody to heaven. But he was a good guy. And, uh, and so he is going, he, he feels like he has this calling on his life. I have no doubt. And then obviously he sees a vision and Jesus says, why kickest thou against the pricks? And, and obviously God was working in his heart and he ended up getting, uh, getting saved. But here's what he said before this is all, uh, this whole ordeal is finished. Verse 15 says, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. God's talking to Ananias he says, about Paul. He says, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So God, as Paul, the Apostle Paul is going to Ananias to receive further instruction God's saying, I've got a calling on this man's life. I've got something I want him to do. He's going to go before the Gentiles. He's going to stand before kings. He's going to preach the gospel. I've got a calling in his life. And, uh, and I think that what we need in the ministry, obviously, what we need in every church are some men who not only have a good report and are good guys, but men with a calling and a vision. And they want to say, Lord, you know, use me. Here am I. Send me. Whatever you, whatever you want me to do, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you to do. And this is what we need, a few good men. Okay, number three. Well, actually, let's look at, let's look at a couple more uh, thoughts on that. Look at Galatians chapter 1. And then we're going to come back to Acts. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse 11. But I certify, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited uh, in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own uh, nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with, the flesh, uh, with flesh and blood, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which uh, were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Just a long story short, God had called him from his womb, from his mother's womb, and he had chosen him to this job. Now you say, oh, is that Calvinist? No, because he still had the free will and he could have rejected that and God would have had a, served and fulfilled another purpose somehow. But I believe God's got a call on every person's life that if they would submit to that, get saved first of all, and then submit to that, there's a, there's a calling on their life. That's just my, that's my belief. And this was the case with the Apostle Paul. God had a special uh, mission uh, set for him to do. And of course he ends up doing that. Look at Acts chapter 13 now. Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, uh, which is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I have called them. And when they had prayed and fasted and, their, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus, and it follows their, their journey. But I want you to see the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, you know, uh, Saul and Barnabas, for the job that I've called them to do. Now, I'll tell you this. Back to the free will conversation. You know what happens later on down the road? Uh, Barnabas and Saul split up and they're no longer working together. You know, we can, we can make our own choices and we can, you know, uh, uh, manipulate God's will in various ways. Okay. I, I don't believe in a 
Calvinist type God that just makes everything happen. If it's going to happen the way he wants it to happen, no matter what, he gives us free will and choices. But ultimately, he knows what's going to happen in our life. It's, uh, it's something that is hard to understand, but that has to do with his foreknowledge. Okay, so, uh, uh, so number three, just let me finish with this point. <clears throat> so we need men of good report, right? We need men with a calling on their lives. And then we need men who will stick with it. This is so important, so important. Every church I've ever been in, uh, every, I mean, the two Bible colleges I've been in, every uh, just friends in the ministry that I've had, I shouldn't say every, but of, in all those situations in my life, the experience, I have seen so many men fall away. I don't mean they lost their salvation, right? Now, some of them maybe weren't saved, but... Uh, but the majority of them, I think, were saved, but they just fell away. They're no longer serving the Lord. You know, maybe they were pastors and then they left the ministry. Maybe they were uh, living for the Lord and then they just went totally secular, back to their secular ways or whatever. Uh, and, and some of these guys would get up there and they'd preach, you know, they'd memorize scripture, they'd do all these things, and everybody's like, oh man, God's really going to use that young man. He's really going to be something one day. And here we are, you know, 20 years later. And they're not even serving the Lord. You wouldn't even recognize that they're that they're believers. You know, we've seen even since this work started. By the way, uh, this last April uh, was our second year uh, that we started the started this work here in Kansas City. And even since we started this work, we've seen multiple people who started with us, and we had high hopes, and we said, "Hey, man, this is gonna you know this is gonna they can work with us. We're gonna be a team. We're gonna reach a lot of people." And they, they're nowhere to be seen now. Some literally fell off the face of the earth as far as my, from my perspective. I was like, what happened to them? I don't know. Some of them, uh, you know, we ended up being, teaching some false doctrine. Some of them got so entangled with the affairs of this world and sin that they just stopped serving the Lord. And they, they still to this day say, I'm going to come back one day. I'm going to come back one day. But where are they? You know, here's what we need. Men with metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. We need men who can endure hard situations and say, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to continue uh, what I started to do. What frustrated Paul so much about John Mark, if you're familiar with that story, was that he didn't stick with it. He didn't stick with it. Acts chapter 15. This is what caused Barnabas and Paul to separate. Acts 15, verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed on to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So uh, Paul went one way and Barnabas went another way with John Mark. Paul picked up Silas. Look, they're both still serving the Lord in this case. That's a, that's a good thing. But they divided, and the reason they divide is because Paul's like, I don't have time for the people who aren't going to stick with it. The people that are going to start off on the course and then be like, yeah, you know what? This isn't for me. And then they're going to leave. And then all of a sudden they come back and they're like, all right, I'm with it this time. He's like, yeah, you know what? You said that last time and you didn't say it. Now, you, you know, whether that's fair or not fair, this was Paul's attitude towards it is all I'm saying. Okay. And what we find uh, is that actually 2 Timothy 4, you don't have to turn there, but verse 9 through 11 Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Now, I don't know that these guys all left him because they loved the world like uh, Demas, but, uh, but for whatever the case, they stopped following. They, they, they stopped uh, going with him on the journey. And then verse 11, he says, Only Luke is with me. And then he says this a wonderful part of the Bible. He says, Take Mark. That's John Mark. That's the John Mark that he departed with because he didn't want him to come along with him. He says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So for whatever reason, he said, I need somebody. I'll take him. <laughs> right? Or maybe he just proved himself and decided, he decided, you know what, I can use this guy after all. The conclusion is this. We have good men, obviously. We have some good men in this church. Uh, we need to continue to get good men. Uh, but like I said earlier, I'd rather have a few good men 
than just a whole bunch of mediocre men or a whole bunch of bad men. I definitely don't want that. Uh, so, but we want good men. And in order to do that, we're going to have to uh, uh, not just be recruited. See, when someone joins the military or, or wants to join the military, they sign the paper and they say, yeah, I want to get in. And uh, then they go and they just get off the bus and they're recruits. You know, they even have to refer to themselves. This recruit, they can't say their name. This recruit, you know, ask permission to speak or whatever, and, they, and that, that's it, right? But, you know, when they get off that bus and they're, they're in the work, that doesn't mean anything. They haven't got through boot camp yet. You know, they haven't finished. A lot of those guys won't finish, you know. Uh, if they stick with it, they're going to pass. But if they don't, a lot of them can't stick with it. they got to go for one reason or another, and, uh, and they can't take it. Uh, all right? Being in the Lord's work, it's going to be more than just signing up saying, yeah, 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 I want to be a member. Yeah, I want to be. No, it's fine if we have if we have that. But what we're really looking for are a few good men who have a good report. Uh, you know, some people might say, man, you know what? I made a lot of mistakes in my past. I didn't have such a good report. Well, you can correct that. You can go back to those people. You can get it right. You can start uh, having a good report from this point on. And, uh, and you can correct that. If you don't feel like you have a calling in your life, because we need men with a calling, you say, well, I just don't know. What's my calling? Well, pray to the Lord. Search that and say, you know, hey, Lord, how would you use me? I guarantee you he's got a calling on your life. Uh, you just need to find out what that is. And, uh, you know, some people... Some people want to know, like, hey, what? how do you know what the will of God is? I've heard that asked so many times. How do you know what the will of God is? Well, here's the key. Just have a desire to serve the Lord and just say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do, and He's going to make it known to you. <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd be a pastor of Iola Baptist Temple, I'll tell you that. But it just happened, and then I'm like, okay, this is God's will. This is what, this is what He called me for, right? Many are called, but few are chosen. Finally, stick with it. Don't quit on God because things get difficult. Don't quit because things get kind of uh, boring. You know, yesterday uh, at, at, I had a kind of our, our quarterly business meeting that I'm finishing up on, long story, but in, in Iola. So I had an abbreviated sermon so that we could talk about that. And I actually had a lot of good things to report about the last couple quarters. Uh, but I said, you know what? Every time I give a report or every time I talk about what's going on in Iola or in Kansas City, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you won't believe it, man. Just such amazing things are happening all the time. Because the fact is, that's not how life goes. You know, about 80% of life is just going to be so-so. It's just going to be just normal, average, nothing exciting. And then about 10% is going to be bad. And then the other 10% is what you what you're hoping for. That's going to be the pleasant time, the good times where you're where you're just so excited that I just totally made those those numbers up. But I'm just saying <laughs> something like that. OK, uh, so uh, so we got to stick with it, even when things just don't seem we're kind of in a rut, you know, or things just don't seem as exciting as they used to be or. Or, you know, here goes pastor preaching the same. I, we, I remember that title from a year ago, right? <laughs> Who cares? Just keep coming to church, keep serving the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> we have a lot more to accomplish with this work for the Lord. And uh, for the time that we got left here on this earth, uh, things are going to get harder. It's going to get harder to serve Him. Everybody understands that, right? We have it pretty easy right now. And so we just ought to take advantage of that and serve Him to the best of our abilities. Lord, we ask your blessings on this work, on these people. And I pray that you will help us to know your will in our lives individually and our will as a church collectively. And I pray that you make that known to us so that we could do the best of our abilities uh, through the power of your spirit. And I pray that you would do that, Lord. Bless us with your spirit and work mightily, Lord, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.